Welcome. This is a November 22nd Jalen Zones call. So far, we have Rod G, Chris M, Jan B, Nick Z, and myself, Michael. And we have a few topics on the board. Uh, first things first, uh, it sounds like the Broadcom com VMware merger might go forward. Go ahead and check all your favorite news sources for that. In other news, FreeBSD 14 has been released. Uh, There's a little, a few sort of meta issues surrounding it, like, oh no, the end of life is soon. And that was just a mistake internally and they're fixing all those. So there's been lots of good public discussion on just how to get past these little issues. There has also been a handbook rewrite and it goes into a whole bunch of new topics. I've got a link in the document. I welcome you to check that out. And Chris, you have put some thoughts into uh, jail and beehive networking. Would you like to address those now? And I can bring up your doc. Yes. So let me just check the start on page. Where is it? On page, 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 page oh, nine. That does maybe nine more out of useful. 12. Yes, I agree. I need to put a table of contents in there. That's good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, our docs had a hundred, like a hundred pages without any. So, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. all relative. It's all. Relative. Uh, here we are. Here we are. I yeah. see nine. Uh, Looking for the yellow. Uh, or... Nine, nine. Uh, page, page nine. A little, a little further to the little network, further, handler. network handler. There it starts. Right. So, basically, background. Um, why did I start that? Um, for those that did not attend the past calls, basically, one of the things that came out of this enterprise working group. Uh, from the FreeBSD Foundation, the talks that we had with Michael Ozipop was that when we look at the, well, I don't want to call it alternatives, but let's say the competitors in terms of what we have on Linux when it comes to Kubernetes, Docker, Podman, and then all the other stuff that, that, that do containerization, then they kind of come with all this tool set that also is doing uh, the network stack, network connection for those containers. And particularly when we look in, at the combination of jails plus Beehive, um, as we also had during our recent calls, then we're actually looking at a competing set of tools because both sides, the jails tools as well as the Beehive tools, which are completely separate, are kind of competing for the attention of bridges. And if one takes on a bridge and puts members on that, then it attempts to... Um, to uh, to uh, manage both of them or basically override the other settings. And well, um, I'm not sure, Jan, you're, you're, you're asking whether to implement a CNI provider. Can you help me out with what do you mean with a CNI provider? I, uh, I'm not CNI uh, is the acronym for Container Network Interface. It's part of okay. the cloud native computing uh, stuff uh, for Linux containers. And mm -hmm. basically it's turns this into an API where you can have different providers with mm -hmm. similar but not identical configurations. So because different types of network attachments require different parameters. Let's say a VEX LAN overlay is a bit different from just VLANs, is a bit different from just bridging. But in the end, mm -hmm. it's all kind of how to tie this little container, jail, you have guess whatever, into the host network. Mm -hmm. and how to attach and basically which tenant do they belong to, stuff like this you put in, and then you have an API to call. Uh, and for example, if we had a proper uh, CNI providers for um, FreeBSD related technologies, either just bridge and tap for Beehive, or mm -hmm. um, a VXLAN one for multi-tenancy. Uh, um, and we have, or maybe, uh, let's say, just bridges and e-pairs for VNet-enabled jails. If you have this, we could, mm -hmm. for example, plug it directly into Nomad and get proper uh, networking there for FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, um, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, please go ahead. This is basically the one uh, kind of standard I've found, which apparently the Linux world has agreed upon. And it's part of the missing glue, basically, for networking. The other one is for storage. There's also the, the 
I don't know the exact details there for the same idea of turning this into an API also exists for storage and they basically differentiate between file storage and block storage. And maybe object storage, I don't know that. I haven't looked into it too much, uh, but yeah. And if we were to adopt these APIs and support them, it would make it possible to reuse the tooling building on top of these two basic technologies. And then you, yeah. It's a bit of an overhead, but it's already supported across different types of runtimes. Uh, yeah, what makes sense to support this or, it, or to uh, find out why we can't support them. Maybe mm. there's a, I don't see any reason why we couldn't, but maybe that it's uh, too uh, cumbersome and not worth it, but it should be a well reasoned decision and not just, yeah, we haven't looked at prior art, let's reinvent the wheel. I completely agree with you. Um, basically, what I jotted down was really um, platform and framework agnostic, sort of. So I kind of went to at the problem, attempting to understand what Kubernetes, Docker, and all these kinds of utilities do in terms of networking, and uh, just compiled a list of stuff that came to mind when I walked through that, basically. And I think those CNI provider uh, approaches, I'm going to check that out. So great input. Thank you. I completely agree. Um, it totally makes sense to, you know, go with a, go with an open standard if that already exists and, and, uh, and plug that in instead of reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. The two things to watch out for is how much overhead is involved, engineering overhead, mostly not runtime overhead, in supporting these standards. And uh, are they expressive enough to support FreeBSD's quite impressive technologies this week? Because we have things like uh, NetGraph uh, to think about, or multiple instances of a network, so nested shares. It, it may just exactly, be that, yeah. that their yeah. schema is not expressive enough even for the kind of common deployments. Um, in that case, you may have to extend it and they're designed to be extensible. The other one is um, it may turn out that they are too specific in some ways, and maybe they have basically forgotten about the idea that not everything is Linux, which kind of would make sense, but I haven't seen this in my look at what would be required to get a CNI for Nomad and FreeBSD. Um, one of the problems right now with our existing interfaces is that at least the command line interfaces are just not idempotent. So something like IF config, uh, let's say I want to create a new uh, tab interface or a new ePair interface. Um, you ha first have to create it from a cloner, which could be something like the bridge driver, the tab driver, or the tab driver under its VM net name or something like that. Then you have to basically, either you have to specify I want this unit number. So I want to create something like E pair zero, and then you get E pair zero A and B or a failure. Okay. Or you just tell it, I want the next available E pair. Then you get that. But normally you, you don't want them to just be numbered. You want them to be named something kind of meaningful associated with what you're doing yeah I yes, completely get your point because yeah. embedding yeah. is a lot easier and avoids one layer of mapping where you have to look up the mapping from uh, for example jail name to ePair interface index it's just annoying having to look that up every time it even it's a lot better if you can just uh, put the jail name into the interface name hmm. Uh, because that saves you the mental load and the race conditions and all the other problems of mapping. Okay. Okay. Let's so if you continue do that, with Chris's outline, go ahead and wrap that up, Jan, and welcome, Dan. Yeah, the short, long shot is yep. the problem is that the existing commands, for example, I can't say I want a bridge named bridge one to exist, or I want a bridge named bridge beehive to exist. Yeah. And if it, if it exists, everything's 
I have written this in, yeah. as a shell script, but it's not pretty, but it works. Mm -hmm. So now I can say, I want an interface to be cloned from this cloner, bridge, top, whatever, to exist and uh, have this name be in this VNet and so on. But yeah, maybe be in a few groups and so on. It's possible to do with existing tools, but at least in some cases, you basically have to let the race condition happen and then recover. Uh, basically, if I can create a, let's say a top interface, and but I can't rename it. I have config will tell me, I, I have failed and I've created a tab interface. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. Understood. And then you uh, have to destroy the created top <laughs> interface and check if someone else used the name in the meantime. And if it's the right cloner, then your job is done despite ifconfig having failed to create and rename an interface. Okay, I'll add a mention of that in your news section coming up. So Chris, go ahead and continue with your document. And right, make sure so- you um, communicated what you're after. All right, so I think Jan, Jan is making some, some great points and, um, and Again, as, as I said before, uh, my original approach uh, so far has been to take a step back and really try to abstract the problem set and hopefully document and create something that can then lead to, you know, considerations of either what kind of frameworks exist that actually already uh, address that, like CNI apparently. And also take, take the step further when we look, for example, at Beehive, when it comes to desired feature sets like moving hosts from, uh, sorry, moving guests from one host to another, and, and probably even do this with jails. I don't know. I mean, theory, it should be possible. We were speaking about mm -hmm. IP movability or something. We call it like what we have with Wiimotion in, uh, in VMware. Then... Mm -hmm. Obviously, this kind of networking problem also becomes one degree more complex because you need to manage those aspects, not just on one host, but maybe even on multiple hosts and the configuration sets, how to synchronize those and so on and so forth. And so my original thought was, okay, we're looking at the, all the interface types that Jan already mentioned, top, ePair, uh, we're looking at bridges, we're looking at NetMap, we're I don't know, maybe even looking at NetGraph, we're looking at VNet uh, in terms of uh, combinations with jails. Uh, it needs to do IPv4, IPv6. It needs to do maybe all sorts of even subnet calculations if we manage to have something that doesn't just you know create the interface, but also ensures that the jail or virtual machine when we're talking about Beehive gets an address in the particular reserve address space that we configure in you know generic terms. And everything, at least that's how I was thinking, everything kind of needs to have a tool set or an interface that is documented and so open that it can be used by shell code that it can be used by Lua and C and everything, you know, so it cannot be just purely C because then again, we would limit ourselves uh, to whatever particular tool set is created. And I was expecting, or I was thinking that whatever is constructed towards uh, better uh, tooling for networking should be so open that it can then also hopefully be adopted by whatever ports and, and, and frameworks want to make use of that. And uh, so that is that is basically what I jotted down here. And I suppose CNI is something that is definitely worthwhile looking at because as Jan pointed out, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So whatever lessons have been learned from designing that should probably also be added in here, I think. And, and yeah, that, that, that is basically it. So I'm, I'm really open to just hearing your thoughts on how you would approach this kind of problem set of creating 
some kind of cooling that is capable of managing networks, managing network connectivity, let's call it, not just for jails, but also for Beehive in, in the best case scenario. Jan, are you a CNI user or you've simply been following it? Or more, let me rephrase um, that. Do we have any CNI experts here? Well, users. I'm not. <laughs> need not be an expert. Um, so keep in mind, uh, Toasterson gave a great zones overview to just get us aligned with what they do and do well. Uh, it might be wise to just have a special show and tell by a CNI user, ideally expert, if anyone can find one. So I'd, I'd be happy to coordinate that in any way, shape, or form. But I guarantee we're not even qualified to ask the right questions without having spent time with it. You know, we can see, I, I put a link to the, the GitHub repo and yeah, well, I guarantee there's more to it. And it looks like you've posted a HashiCorp doc. Thank you. Uh, Jan, you've added some more comments. I've transferred over quite a few. Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll go ahead with that HashiCorp doc. Hopefully the licensing hasn't changed. Uh, can anyone think of someone who might fit that description? Put that in. Okay, uh, let's have a CNI user as a guest. <clears throat> so Jan, the link from HashiCorp is an example of con a consumer of CNI. Now, what I meant by consumer in my chat comments is that right now what we have is we have the command line tools and we have the system calls uh, as an interface. Yeah. Potentially starting with 13.2, we also have the uh, the Netlink uh, protocol right. to do a yeah. part of some of that, uh, which may mean that at least the not too advanced Linux stuff may just work if you run it in the Linux uh, <laughs> ADI. But um, of course, you can't uh, access the advanced FreeBSD specific features directly without knowing about them with generic Linux tools because they don't know about FreeBSD specific features to take advantage of. So what we have is we are, uh, for example, IF config internally as an implementation detail, where it's something called libif config, but it mostly deals with doing the I octals and not anything uh, really abstracting them away. So is it like user facing see... or not? What was your no, comment it's about not, it's not being in base? It's implementation <laughs> uh, detail of okay. IF config. It isn't installed as a library even. I think it's only statically built into IF config. Oh, so okay. really... Because I is... checked out the I checked the code for IF config how IF config actually assigns IP addresses because yeah. I kind of wanted to understand how this whole thing does it. It does it, and through, I did uh, not see any library calls. It just does IOCTL and I figured, okay, there's yeah, nothing for there. Example, yeah. If you want to find out the list of uh, cloners on the systems, you will find out that the function isn't anywhere defined in uh, IF config source. You have to find out that there's a library which isn't installed but only compiled and then statically linked into okay, IF config. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, makes so sense. It may be that someone has already tried to implement this interface and then mm. moved away and did only the relevant part. But the problem with changing anything with IF config is because it's the only stable interface, basically. But it's still a fragile interface because you have to pass the human readable output back. So you, whenever you change something in IF config, you have to be very careful not to break anything uh, with, with regards to formatting because it will probably explode someone else's automation if you change the output. So we are limited in how much we can clean it up without breaking the backward compatibility to the only interface available other than the, the raw iOctals. Um, so a lot of stuff consumes IF config and not the raw system calls. And what I would like to see as a way forward is basically a library to have a stable API to these functionalities. 
And then the next layer on top of that, a CNI provider could uh, be written against this library instead of them having to either p open if config tons of times. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, um, and the other problem is that the octets may not really be treated as an a stable external ABI, but more of an implementation detail by some developers. So yeah, and putting this into a shared library would be a place where basically breakages in the ABI could be um, abstracted away so that you would still get a stable API even if the implementation changes over time, because some of this is quite low level and very specific to how the kernel currently does stuff. Rodney, you've moved a packet or two over the years. Any observations and thoughts on this? No, my only, the only comment I have is I believe libifconfig is a private library and it's private because they don't want to expose its interfaces so they can change them all they want. It's more than just private. It's not even installed as a library. It's only compiled and then used to build IF config. If you look for a lib That's IF my config. That's definition of private library. No, other libraries are marked private and still installed as shared libraries or even statically linked libraries. For example, the um, libucl, it's there, it's in slash lib, it's just with a private something in the name. I see. Chris, does that help paint the picture you're hoping to paint? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's been great pointers. Thank you. That's, that's definitely good. Nick, did that inspire anything or Dan? No, I'm good. Dan, who's making holes where no, there were no holes. Not, not me, because I'm making holes on walls and I was under my desk, not, not here. Okay, me. cool. Well, uh, other topics before Jan gives us a little, a few more updates on his work. So we touched on lib if config. Thank you. Um, so segueing. Jan, you mentioned a shell script, perhaps proof of concept that is implementing some of the item potents you'd like to see in networking. How, uh, what stage is that at? Like napkin notes or ready um, for review and just, testing? Yeah, the shell script is there. Let me just make it available. Okay. Please do. And I'm certain the junipers of the world have their own strategies for banging on if config or PF sense, open sense, et cetera. So yeah, we don't want to break anything for anyone, but I'm sure they've done what they've done for want of certain in-base functionality. So we'll wait on that uh, POC. Will that be a link, most likely? Yeah, it will be a link in a minute. Great. Okay, take your time. Um, while he's preparing that, I will nudge. Let's see. I will nudge a frequent attendee. You do okay. We have a gist copy. Uh. I'll put it. So I've uh, shared the usage. Yes, thank you. As chat message. Uh, just one um, sec. I'll load that for you. You can comment. Yep. Boom, boom. This is not intended to be a good interface. It's only good enough to get me going. It's not that I would want to basically put this in stone. And it's the script because I like the better name. Uh, it's called just interface and the first example dash C, you tell the cloner and then the name of the inter the instance of the cloner you want to have. Let's say I want to have a e pair named 
Uh, no, ePair is not supported. Everything but ePair is supported by the script file. The other one, you have to use the MK ePair. Um, so here, uh, let's say I want a tab interface named tab VM0. And then you invoke it as interface dash lowercase c tab dash uppercase c um, tab VM0. It creates a new dynamically allocated tab. Uh, and we named it unless, but if the interface already existed and was part of the tab group, it would instead say, oh, uh, my work is done. If it created a tab, but then finds out that it can't be renamed, it cleans up after itself and checks if there is such a tab interface. Maybe you have invoked it twice in the same uh, micro segment or something like that. So um, it recovers from the races, yeah. And supports adding members to bridges, uh, passes the output from my F config to find out which members are on the bridge and so on. And you can chain multiple operations behind each other. So you can say, I want a bridge named bridge zero to exist. I want my tab interface named this and this to exist. I want the tab interface to be a member of the bridge interface. Uh, And Did it you... can also call out to the existing netifrc.d script to uh, finish the configuration. It can bring them up and down if that covers your use case, which it does for bridges and behalf if you don't want to put addresses on them. If you want to put addresses on them, I didn't want to do too much, so I just added an option to call out to netif. Like that. What was the name of your ePair helper? And it's probably uh, look the, at the minutes. It was yeah, it's in the minutes. Okay. Something. Okay. Um, yeah, it's the it. ePair helper for uh, Jared. Okay. This really doesn't want me to reformat it, does it? Goodness. Yeah, uh, the chat is not uh, fixed uh, with, so uh, the formatting is broken. Oh, you! Oh, I pulled it straight out of the other doc, uh, out of the gist, which might have made it worse. So, thank you. No, no, the gist has uh, should have uh, proper tabs. Uh, oh, the so problem is uh, so much so it recognizes it as a table and is like, "You want a table?" I'm like, "No, I don't want a table." Yeah. Uh, so I'll fight that, um, and I can format the table. Good lord. Um, okay. Um, yeah, but the, Jan, so did the, you base that? user experience on something existing or just um, based on your own experience? Mostly my own. That's cool. Um, so here's the uh, usage for MKE pair. Oh, the single, oh, that already that is too long, okay. I have to break it up. Oh, okay. for the chat. You can drop it straight yeah. in the dock if you just make a space for it, a landing zone. So yeah, it ate the leading white spaces a bit. But um Okay. This is what the, the other helper script does. It can uh create e pairs. But ePairs are a special problem because you ask for them and then you get two interfaces, neither of them named what you asked for because one has the A, the F or the B suffix. Yep. Hey. Did you drop that? Okay, usage, yes. And it's in the multiple pieces. So. Yeah, I had to I had to break it into three messages in chat uh, because uh, I put too much helpful usage information in the script. Um. So back to a previous question: How far along do you consider these in their maturity? The scripts. Uh, I've tested them; they work for me, uh, but they're not really. Well, they're just hacks around what is there. They're not okay. a good design 
Mm. Do you, you want, want? Are you seeking the help or review of others? Oh. Okay, so I mean, because it was a bit tragic that your impressive wire guard RC script materialized and then did not get much love from the project. It's yeah, the really insane one I refused to even submit because it was starting to. Uh, resemble a poor man's lisp system and not a shell script anymore well maybe but um that one I dumped I, it down so we but got I to see it. the yeah the, the lightweight version yes goodness okay the other one had uh lots of basically uh used higher order functions to loop over the past configuration so you could say something like with configuration and then Provided the path to the configuration and then invoke a function with this in dynamic scope okay. and have okay. Okay. the other one to cool. map over the PS uh, attribute so that you could write a one liner later on to just do something with the configuration. Okay. Yeah. So, it's, Chris, having brought this up, hopefully this helps paint that picture. It's not something you, uh, it was too clever by half. The second and we attempt, thank you for I, it. And the third one uh, is simple enough, I think, but still covers most use cases. Okay. And that's the one I, I submitted as a bug report. And yeah, well, feel that was free third to turn gen. that okay. into <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's the third one. Nice. Uh, that said, do you want to talk about your S6RC discoveries? Uh, yeah, I found out oh. again what I already knew, oh. namely that S6RC. Uh, uh, really wants you to do things right or not at all uh, and doesn't forgive taking shortcuts. So I had to uh, do it the hard way. And I think I solved the problems of making F6RC user-friendly enough by wrapping it up and making sure that you can't get, for example, locked out of your system halfway through a reconfiguration uh, a by running the reconfiguration as a supervised service itself. And then just a using a tail dash uppercase F to show the user the logging output so that you it feels like the command is running in the foreground, but in reality, the reconfiguration happens under supervision in a dedicated helper service. And that service can then finish so that you don't get sick up uh, to death if you okay. maybe do the wrong thing. No, not that reconfiguring Beehive is that uh, dangerous as managing, for example, your SSH service and your X org on a workstation or something with it, which I've done. And okay. yeah, it can happen there that, for example, you add a dependency to X org. Uh, apply the new configuration. So I have to restart XORG and then it kills XORG and you're logged out. Uh, but uh, the, that also killed your terminal emulator. Takes your terminals with it, terminal, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Because your terminal emulator was killed, yep. the uh, migration stopped because the command running in the foreground on a controlling terminal got a sick hub. Yeah. And that's not fun. And so I spent the effort of making sure this is solved and not just uh, hidden. So is has that reached just phase status? Something Is there something um, you can share? I can share something, but deploying it is not yet um, clean enough to, so that I will feel comfortable inflicting that on someone else. OK. Uh, do you want to save that? Because for... I've hacked too much too, too late in the night on okay. it. OK, yeah. So yeah. Um, so perhaps but on tomorrow's share. Beehive call? Maybe if I can clean it up by then, yes. OK, awesome. Um, now, you mentioned an aspect that relates to jails. Or is that for jailed Beehive? It would be both, baby. Um, you can use it to uh, solve the state tracking problem for jails. Ah, do, do tell. OK. the um, you would use it like this. You don't use um, MFARL jails. You only use persistent jails. Everyone. Okay. Yep. And then you break it up into basically running uh, only the anything before the jail start. Then you run the jail start. 
and then you have run the teardown again. So that you do the, can have the break it up into basically set up, run time, and teardown. Yep. Uh, with the assumption that uh, the setup stages are one shot commands you execute for the side effect. Uh, the runtime is a long running process you want to supervise. And the uh, teardown again is a one shot script or a collection of one shot scripts yeah. with a timeout. And you want to really run this to completion for a side effect of cleaning up again. And yeah, then you could basically do this and potentially instead of just having a single script or a bunch of hack together lines in your jail conf, you could break it up into a bundle of one shot services to do the setup. And maybe you need a companion service like a syslog forwarder and the host for the jail and so on. And then you can do this orchestration stuff in a formalized uh, and reliable way instead of yeah. just cobbling something together which works most of the time. So S6 would supervise the three steps, I take it? S6RC? Yes. OK, so breaking them the up alone is the service manager it? and S6 okay. without the RC suffix is basically just the process supervision. And S6RC is a service manager written on top of that. Okay, make uh, it so. I still let me check. I found my um. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, my uh, is it at least a version of my old uh, two thousand eighteen UBSD con talk slides on that. Okay. Uh, welcome, Antrenig. You. Just missed Jan's update on S6RC. However, he is cleaning up his code for sharing. Oh, I did talk with him today, so no worries. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. So yeah, we 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 do, we do a developers call before the call. <laughs> oh, did kidding. you? Okay, good, good. Okay. Ah, thank you. I'll see. Thank you for that link. I will drop it in. Uh, that uh, this was... talk was focused on uh, basically what it takes to use S6RC as image system replacement instead of the FreeBSD in it and um, RC scripts for a FreeBSD system. And at the time uh, when I ran it on my daily driver laptop um, that way, I got the boot time down to like, 800 milliseconds from starting of the first process to a graphical login screen. And most of that was spent in initializing the GPU driver. Okay, well. So, yeah. Uh... Depending on the Wi-Fi situation, actually connecting to a WPA to enterprise network may take longer. So it may be that you log in and the Wi-Fi comes up a second or two later. Yeah. Because yeah, but but that's in parallel. That, yes, everything. S6 RC starts each service the moment its dependencies are satisfied. Got it. Okay. So it's always parallel. If you want to sequentialize it, you have to turn the dependency tree into a single linked list. And key point, it has a notion of dependencies. <laughs> It has a notion of dependencies, and the notion of dependency is intentionally limited to hard requirements on a service being ready. Uh, there is not, none of this uh, mushy stuff like, I'm wanted by this service. Please start me in parallel with this service, but don't fail if I don't start, and don't wait for anyone to be ready. Just start everything in parallel and hope. Okay. Uh, if you have, why well, have dependency? If you do that, then you can just have no dependency and just enable everything and yeah, just it shake itself into yeah. a, a hopefully working system, which is okay. noisy, but depending on the services, it works. And is what things like um, 
the original demon tools did back going back into the late 90s. Yep. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, thank you. Anything else, Jan, or shall we hear from Antrenig and hear what news you have that you shared privately uh, earlier? Regarding the question, yeah. you use the CTL uh, admin command. Yep. And oh, yes. with the port sub command and the uh, dash r flag to remove the port remove. by uh, index. Uh, port dash r and then three to get rid of that ice scuzzy target that just wouldn't die for me that's, which is i love the durability but still uh, yeah that's excellent uh, wait a second uh, yeah yep that should do it um maybe that the problem is that it isn't uh really important no it is a port so that should do what you want okay it's probably that ctld died in an unpleasant way and didn't finish up after itself oh hard to say or yeah. ice -cause -d, i don't know yeah. One of the two died okay. and didn't clean up after. Got it. Uh, and that's a kind of intentional because if you restart it, it can pick them up again. And then you don't lose your SCSI, iSCSI devices when we re restart the demon, which is normally what you really want. Yeah, no, it was because remarkably durable. Because you don't want durable. the SCSI devices to disappear if the demon is restarted because that could panic the system because all the, the uh, ice gazi discs just disappeared into a thin air. Yep. So with Antrenig landing uh, as a segue, Antrenig, did you find that while this is a bit more beehivey that you can't run SRIOV Nix with MTU 9000? Wait, what? You mentioned no. earlier that you had jumbo frames bringing you to tears oh um so my issue my issue is kind of specific to me but might be useful to other people as well um so SRIOV and mtu with 9000 so okay let me bring it back a bit a bit back i have a host machine running free bsd with zfs yep. um that also has an nfs export and I also have a guest on Beehive using, as of today, Super V. Um, that is a Linux uh, 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 guest, uh, Ubuntu, whatever the latest long-term support is. Yeah. And uh, it, it needs to mount to the NFS. So my original, very, very, very original problem was that the bandwidth was not good because of two, uh, two uh, sorry, tap interface and bridge. So I ended up doing uh, pass-through on the PCI. Yep. But due to networking limitations, I thought, hey, maybe I can do SRIOV. So now I'm doing, I, and I'm calling this a uh, a, a cross SRIOV. Uh, maybe I, um, I'm inventing the term. I am not sure and, about this. Uh, Antrenic, your audio is really loud. If you could tone that. Oh, down. loud. Yeah, oh, that, that, yeah. that has never happened before. I, mean, I know, right? Who, who complains that your audio is, you know, very high? Let me see. Oh, you know, it's on max. You're right. You're right. Cool. Okay. How about now? Uh, now you're a bit quiet, but but more manageable. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, so, it's so, flipping, actually. It's, it's, it's flipping? Flipping. It's peaking. Uh, clipping. It's clipping. Was, uh, the... clipping. So it sounds like basically the loudness saturated and then the waveform was chopped off at the edges which uh, has a certain buzzing kind of sound. I think we're better. One, two, three, four. Oh, yeah, sure. much better. Yeah. Oh, okay. OK, good. OK, uh, where was I? I completely uh, forgot. Yeah, so oh. you initially were passing through the whole device. Then you tried SRIOV uh -huh. and. So my network limitation was that um, I need, uh, I have two systems on a physical machine. I have the host and a guest. And they also need to talk with the internal network. I might also have GL, so it's a complex system. And but I also wanted good performance. So I thought, okay, well, there is one way to do this, the which is the right way, which is setting up you know VLANs properly. But uh, this is a production system. If I do anything on the VLAN la layer, my users are gonna go crazy. And you know, supporting a university with a couple of hundred people is not a good idea to do that during a work day. So I thought, hey, it's a single machine. Let me let, let me just change the single machine instead of the whole network. So now both of the NICs have SRIOV virtual functions to each. 
So there is two each. And the reason why I do that is one is for the uh, internet access and one is for the uh, uh, LAN access. And the way it goes is that, so Nick A's virtual, um, virtual function zero goes out from the guest and goes into Nick B's virtual function zero of which which is connected to the host. So you know it always goes one from one of the interfaces and goes into the other of the interfaces if the host and a guest. So you know I don't have a single NIC with two virtual functions that is one for the host and the other for the guest. So it, it's never split because you know the, the most of the traffic is going to be between the host and the guest in this scenario. Um, but no, now it's working fine. Uh, unfortunately, that did not actually. Oh, you really built a loop back. Built a physical loop. Yes, yes, I did. The kind of yes, yes. Uh, not a good idea. I need to move this in, into VLAN, of course, instead of using all instead of doing all of those. Uh, where was I? Yes, of course. And um, I, it didn't fix my problem. I still don't know if it was a Linux problem or a BSD problem, but I I I can bet my ten dollars that it's it's a Linux problem because I did mount another free BSD VM. Uh, and I did not have the same issue. The issue was server, NFS server not responding, trying again, or server, NFS server not responding, timed out. And you I think kept that getting... was MTU related? I thought it was bandwidth related, so oh. I hired the MTU. Yes. Oh, I first see. I moved, mm. First, I moved from bridge to uh, pass-through, then from pass-through to pass-through plus SRIOV. But no, none of those actually fixed my issue. Actually, it even made it even worse with MTU 9000 because now, um, due to a lot of reasons that Jan educated me today, which I will go over if anyone wants, but the long story short version is that the M buffs were not properly allocated because I did not know how to do that properly. Now, you have a VM with 1.5 terabyte of RAM. You have ARC with one, you know 100 something gig. And then there are pages of mbuffs that apparently on this specific NIC has to not just be in the mbuffs, but also have to be physically next to each other. And uh -huh. if the continuous. system... Exactly, continuous pages. And hmm. if the system is lacking those, which it will due to my excessive amount of uh, you know, um, ARC and, and, and Beehive usage, it's going to crap out and he's going to tell you admin queue unavailable, which is an error. Yes. Yeah, it, it's a weird error that I've never seen anywhere else. Um, I, I might even have a, I, I might even have a screenshot in this case just to make sure that I'm telling. Yeah, there we go. So it would say unable to allocate memory for admin queue event, right? Okay. Unable. Yeah, unable to allocate memory for admin queue event. And then your whole networking is going to go down. So uh, um, one of the details yes. here to watch out for is that the X710 NIC you're using mm -hmm. is kind of into its re first real big redesign of the 10 gig NICs, where instead of dedicated hard they they moved a lot of the functionality into a uh, software and then had a buggy. Uh, firmware running on the NIC to handle all of it. So instead of reconfiguring hardware registers, you're sending messages to the firmware through the admin queue. And so for a lot of things, which on simpler, older NICs, uh, you would use uh, just some register to write into. Here, you send a message to the firmware running on the card. Over time, I think most of the firmware bugs have been resolved by updates. And these days, these NICs are usable, but when they came out, it didn't matter if you were using FreeBSD, uh, normal Linux, something like VMware, everyone was complaining about these things as terrible because the hardware did uh, very little and the firmware did far too much. Hmm. And then, for example, they broke LLDP because they wanted to implement it in the firmware so that their Windows driver could support LLDP, but uh, yeah, that meant that nothing else could use it because the firmware would just steal the frames out of the buffer and stuff like this. 
problems with uh, putting them into LACP groups because again, the firmware tried to intercept the messages there and so on. Then some bugs in the offloading and it was really a mess when it came out. Yep. Uh, but supposedly these days they work about as well as other cheap 10 gig NICs. So Jan, the register messaging was replaced by what? By sending messages to the firmware through the administrative queue. Uh, I looked at the driver when it exploded at me uh, yeah. years ago. And uh, in that case, back then, I just got rid of the card, returned it to sender. Yep, yep, yep. And cool. uh, bought an older generation card, which just worked as expected. These days, you don't want to buy the old, old cards anymore. Mm, but but yeah. they're proven. Okay, other topics, or shall we call it good and meet perhaps later for ZFS and tomorrow for Beehive? And I can save I just, the Beehive question for another day. Go ahead. I just wanted to point out that my solution that kept me awake all night was that just stop using NFS3, move to NFS4 as if the last three hours is working properly. That said... Uh, did you have to configure it for uh, users and such, or did you simply change protocol and everything was fine? So I I like share NFS. I, I think I'm, I'm one of the few people. And because I had share NFS all configured for me via the, uh, what do you call that? The inheritance. Yeah. Thank you, ZFS. Yeah. The only paper, thing yeah. that, yeah. The <laughs> only thing that I did is I, in the Etsy export, the actual file, not the ZFS export file, I added a single line, V4 colon slash. That's it. Just that's it. And uh, then, colon slash would uh, really export your root file system via NFS, which may not be what you want. Actually, I, I thought that too. But then when I checked, turns out it's just points to the root of the file system. Yes. That, but not but not the export itself. Yes, but that means that you then have to use you basically leak the prefix and all the clients have to learn it. I leak the prefix. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, it's you, not you a big is... problem. It's just yeah. that now basically your pool name or whatever is basically part of the network configuration exposed to other systems. Exactly. Exactly. Now my MNT is leaked basically. If, if I have it in MNT, right, in this case. Yes. And that's the only, it doesn't mean that anyone can mount the root file system itself. Hmm. Yeah, that's the only thing I did. And for your question, uh, Michael, you know, about users and etc. we use LDAP already. So I didn't do any of the UID to strings or, you know, user mapper, group mapper, any of those. But I will be testing those on my other infrastructure just to be sure that everything is working fine without LDAP as well. But um, no, the 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 the, uh, the I want to call it migration, I guess. The yeah. migration process went, went pretty much okay. Even the, um, what do you call that? After I did that, I also set um, um, NFS v4 only on the FreeBSD host. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, and, um, and uh, that's pretty much it. Now all of my mounts are done over NFS4 and as of now, I still don't have any issues on the system actually. So I hope it continues that way. Out of curiosity, are you using Everos or KTLS with that? No, no, this, these are, this is a, you know, it's, it's a very locked down infrastructure. I didn't have any security things to configure there. Um, I do have another infrastructure that I'm looking forward to test Kerberos or any kind of TLS authentication, but I don't see any docs about those, actually. Maybe I missed them. Maybe it's in a separate man page. I don't know. But it's definitely not in the NFS man page or even in the NFS v4 man page, I think. Yeah, ATLS, I think, is not that well documented because it's rather new, I think. Yeah. But, but before my experience is... Let him finish. Oh, sorry. No, Chris, go sorry. ahead. You've got the floor. 
Uh, well, my experience is that uh, what, what's his name? Uh, who wrote it? Um, I, 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 I got in touch with him to ask him for help, and he's very responsive. Um, what I would love to see for uh, NFS over um, TLS is to basically pin a, a mapping from client certificate to uh, user ID so that I can have a mount point with it with a client certificate and that client certificate would basically contain the user this mount is on the host so that I can have multiple NFS clients connecting to an export as different user IDs effectively. Yes. Yeah, that, but, that actually, I, I don't know, uh, do you, any idea if that would work with a Mac OS system? So say if I have Say if I have a free BSD server somewhere with NFS v4, where Antronix's UID is say ten thousand, but on my Mac I'm, well I don't know what what am I on my Mac? I, on my Mac I'm five hundred and one for some reason. Can I use the uh, user mapper to mount my NFS with Antronix ten thousand on my Mac where Antronix is five hundred and one? Is that something doable, or is that only on With Linux? And... NFS v4 and using thing as it's intended to be used in the RFC with names as strings on the wire, not the user IDs as strings uh -huh, uh -huh. on the wire. Uh, uh -huh. As long as the usernames match, uh, NFS will work. Interesting. Uh, but the problem is that Apple's NFS uh, code could use some um, maintenance and care, especially the NFS v4. It was written at a time when Apple has kind of g given up on anything but iPhones. Of course. Yes. Because yeah, if I'm you want to move ahead within Apple, you kind of have to work on the fancy thing on which you can get pre pretty presentations on how you changed some uh, user interface for the third time uh, yeah, that, that, in a way that, that looks better on slide decks instead of being more usable. Yeah, that, that, I, I, that, that's also maybe a question for the next call because I've been always wondering how to have ZFS plus MFS plus SMB on the same data set. So I could that's use my iPhone as well. That's a question and they've done some work towards that, but it's definitely a challenge. And that's one thing that apparently Ganesha NFS gets correctly for file locking, but Ganesha fell out of the ports tree with Python 2 to 3. Oh. Uh, with oh. 27 being removed because it with, was part of the build process. Yep. With our experience, it we never had a locking issue, but we always had a permissions issue. Like the permissions showing on the actual file system and on NFS, and no, not NFS. NFS and file system were always the same, but NFS file system versus Samba were always different. Hmm. We couldn't figure ever out how to make Samba look the same as it is actually on the file system. Um, so yeah, I think I need like a year of sabbatical just to learn how Samba works, but maybe that's for another year. Chris, thank you very much for this document. This is going to be... Oh, and this is the developer himself, that's right? Him. Yes, yep. that's Rick Mellon. I'm okay. documenting it. Oh, that's Rick good. Rick Mellon, yeah, but he, he seems to be retired now. I, I When I got in touch with him, he still was at the university, I think. But I suppose you can still reach him, I think. He's basically our Mr. NFS at FreeBSD. Exactly, yeah. And Chris, I've heard comments that his lab could use some upgrades if he's still in the game. Oh yes. Okay. If he's if he's retiring, let's see if he's he can take out take take in a mentee mentor. And mentee, he's got the sabbatical for hopefully the rest of his life. Let's hope some good stuff comes out of that. That's wow. That's pretty comprehensive. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that link. But for fourteen, some of these steps I think are no longer required. Good to know. And another thing I would it, recommend... It has become uh, better, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, KTLS, I think, is already in. DTLS? Sorry, why DTLS? Uh, K -K KTLS. You, you, you had to compile it in manually, if I remember yeah, correctly. And I think uh, you no longer have to do that. 2, I think, also contains it in generic. 
it's maybe feature gated behind the SysCTL, but I think it no longer requires recompiling. But uh, in 13.1, it did, uh, or in stable in between, at least. Um, the other thing to watch out for is that uh, if you want a less painful way to generate your self signed certificates, I can recommend the uh, just the IP. A PKI command from the strong swan port. Strong swan is normally uh, the least bad of the uh, IPsec demons um, in ports, but it contains a quite useful uh, command line interface to generate a certificate, sign them. Generate. It's a lot user more user friendly than the open SSL interface. Just their P IPsec PKI command. It's none of this command is IPsec specific. It's just the way to gen generate certificate requests, sign them, generate self-signed certificates, generate a private keys in a less and painful way. And it supports all of the common input and output formats in one command, so you don't have to convert. No kidding. What's their license out of curiosity? Uh, check it. Uh, for I'm looking for. That's encouraging. I mean. Picking and choosing DPI might not V2. be a bad thing. Oh, okay. But hey, it's a user space helper command. Oh, yeah. We're talking. Oh, I know. I can drop it in here. I'll drop this in the chat. I found the manual page and synopsis and goodies. So cool. Exactly. Thank you for that. <laughs> and thank and you, it's Debbie. It's scripting for... friendly because it uh, supports writing them to and reading from standard input and output. Nice. So you may be sometimes confused why it doesn't do anything until you p copy and paste in uh, the certificate request when you want to sign something, <laughs> if you just started on the TTY without typing the right request in. But you can also write directly to files. And I found it a lot more useful than going through OpenSSL subcommands. Yeah, no, so, that's really good to know. And it's a, I'm having a flashback to when Debian dumbed down all their certs by accident, trying to just chase down a warning. And then some really good certificate generation docs came out of that. <laughs> like here, we have to regenerate everything. Here's how we do it. Look at that. And you don't have to write certain files into a con certain parameters into the configuration file because there's no command line uh, way to set it. Okay. But you have to have the template out of configuration and then use it. I don't know if you change that and you can finally pick things like the ECDSA key length and stuff like this without going for a configuration file. Nice. Yep. Nice, nice, nice. Other ridiculously kind and helpful tips. Yes. Um, oh, way off topic. Well, on and off topic. No. Completely on topic. Is RCTL broken? Is anyone using it on production? What are you trying to throttle? Resource uh, controls, right? Yes, either memory use or vMemory use. Any of those would um, work. Have you uh, set the loader tunable to enable it? Yes, yes. Otherwise, it wouldn't Is work. Is it enabled? Yes. Do you get an error loading your uh, resource limits? Does it go print you back the resource limits once if it doesn't print an error loading there? Um, th does it print the resource limits? Uh, you mean not the applied one, but the real one, as in the real no, time no, one? The, yes. the rule set. What do you mean? RCTL L or something, I think. What, you may want did to you get an it, error per se, or what happened? Look at the uh, jail manager's oh, usage of um, it. Maybe I should re re redefine what I was trying to do. Um, I am trying to do... What is that command? I am trying to limit a jail's vMemory use and the memory use. However, it's not limiting it. It's not denying it. Uh, so in RCTL, um, there are two commands. One of them is display what it is right now. And the other one is display what limitation you want it. When I do display what I want, it's more than what I wanted. What it is, is more than what I wanted. 
Okay, that's strange, unless it's a very small rounding error. The other thing to watch out for is if what V memory limits is the amount of address space, not the amount of backing memory for the address space. Uh, yep, I, I, yeah, I know the difference between V memories and memory use, yes. And the other problem, if you limit the real memory too much, you basically force the kernel to swap it mm -hmm. or page it, depending on how you want to call it, uh, which can really uh, cause a lot of overhead. Let's say you allow someone 10 gigs of address space, one gig, uh, gig of backing memory, and you have like you 2,000 gigs of real memory. And then mm -hmm. your system suddenly starts swapping because this jail here is not allowed to uh, make reasonably fast process, uh, progress. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, you can really uh, shoot yourself in the foot with it. The other annoying thing is the PCPU to watch out for because that is done by the scheduler with scheduling granularity. So it can introduce a lot of jitter when you oh. run into the PCPU limit because you will basically be limited to um, your percentage until your percentage has decreased again, then you get another scheduler uh, quantum. So therefore interactive commands, not interactive as in your editor in a terminal, but as in, let's say uh, some graphical application like a browser, mm -hmm. it can really be uh, really annoying because for example, scrolling just starts to stutter because it doesn't get the CPU time in bursts but gets chopped up into scheduler uh, quantum sized uh, CPU contingent allocations. No, no, in this case, in this case, it's just that I ask it to limit the memory use to eight gigs. It mm -hmm. said, okay, I will do that. No errors found in the command. And then I said, okay, show me what the, what is the memory use right now? And it said 22 gigs. I'm like, no, no, weren't you supposed to block at eight uh, gigs? I'm may only apply to future allocations. So the idea would be to create the in the jail.created hook. It's restarted. The jail, the, 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 the jail is restarted. No worries. No, no. You have to do it in the jail.created hook before you start anything inside the jail. No, no. I'm, I mean, the whole jail has been restarted after I applied mm -hmm. the rule. And it still does uh, If you restart the jail, I think the rules basically get deleted with the jail, right? You have if to reply I... them every time, I think. So are you issuing the limitations at before the jail start? Is the question. No, I'm I'm issuing the limitation manually. Well, after jail start or before? Before jail starts. Okay. Try it after the jail has been created, but before any processes are running inside of it. Try what? So if you look at the in jail.conf at the exact dot something hooks, uh -huh. there's the exact dot created. It yes. gets executed on in the host system, not inside yes. the jails, after the jail has been created, but before the Vnet interfaces are moved over. The next place okay. you can hook it is uh, the jail.start, which runs inside the jail. So what this does is it applies the rules after the jail command has created an empty jail with no processes inside of it. Uh, so that the restrictions are in place by the time the exec.start commands are executed. Mm. And it would probably be a good idea to uh, remove them in exec.poststop. Uh, once the jail has been removed so that they don't linger and pollute the output. Okay, 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 okay. Um, and the um, other question is, which action did you use? Deny? Deny, I use deny. Maybe use devctl? Uh, How would I use devctl? Uh, why use devctl? Because that you can easily check by uh, run uh -huh. cup slash var run defty dot pipe uh, okay. and then basically start a bunch of work which should just exhaust the limit and you should get a devctl notification message 
uh, forwarded from uh, the DevCQL device through DevD to your uh, pipe. Hmm. So the DevCTL device could be used with a jail? No, it can be. DevD is by default always running on the host. Yeah. Uh, reading from the DevCTL device. Ah, okay. And if you set uh, the action to DevCTL, you basically get a notification in the uh, system RCTL subsystem rule and then type equals matched. And that can then be used to run your own script in response to uh, some restriction being uh, yeah, over consumed. And then you can maybe do a clean shutdown of the offending service instead of just letting it crash with a failure to allocate memory. You, let's say you have an annoying leaking application, which restarts a lot faster if you ask it to, nicely to restart rather than letting it crash and then restarting it, uh, forcing it to recover its uh, data from the database journal or something. And I think this output will make things even a bit cleaner. There you go. Just I, 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 I'm sure I'm doing it right, right? I, I, I've set my it's jail. Na jail named LDAP zero. Yes. And I found some examples. Did you go off like wiki or handbook? Because I see manual page. Okay. You may want to check the pod jail manager. It has support for this. It mostly uses it to show the resource consumption per jail hmm. so that it can use the, the current consumption uh, tracked against even an, un, an arbitrary high limit to tell you how much uh, memory a jail is currently using. It, it is telling me how much it's using. It's using 22 gigs. Oh. But yeah. when I but I told it to limit it to eight gigs. That that's what I'm saying. Hmm. Yeah. And that's but if you do that, go ahead. So basically, any future uh, virtual memory allocation so allocation of address space should now fail uh, inside the jail. Okay, so let's we can assume it's a bug. Mm -hmm. It could be a bug, or it could just be that resource limitations aren't uh, active and not enforced. Mm. But it's strange because then I think it shouldn't allow you to load rules. Exactly. Maybe that you found a regression. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't checked that the limits are applied. <laughs> and just to be blunt, uh, does 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 uh, top confirm that within the jail itself, just to make sure maybe it is working. It's just reporting it wrong, hypothetically. I've been able to get limits working in a jail for the number of processes that are allowed to run in the jail. Does that help? Um, that one is working fine with me. My, okay. The only, yeah, the only one that I'm, I mean, the only ones I've tried is the process memory usage and the core dump one. But I've only had problem just today. Like I've never seen this problem before. Although to be clear, last time we used this on production was on 12.4. So I we haven't tested it on 13's branch ever. So I don't the limits were working and stopped working or what? The yeah, the limits, not on this machine specifically, yeah. but yeah, the, 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 the limits were working. I have oh, a system. Okay. Yeah, where like if it gets there, then the process would be like, oops, something is missing, you know? Oh, Under that's what interesting. version? Under uh, 13? Uh, uh, 12.4. Oh, oh, well, yeah. that's good to know. Yeah, we, we jumped from 12.4 to 13.2 and now to 14 very fast. <laughs> yeah. Was it working on 13 too or 13 something? Was uh, we've never used 13s on production before. Okay. Since the twelves were there, we 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 were very happy with it. Actually, my blog post is about thirteen point one, and all I was trying to do is to limit the number of processes that the jail could could have. Uh, one thing you can do if you're comfortable doing things, for example, for a CTF, you can have the jail with zero processes allowed and mm -hmm. still attach an existing process to it so that the 
process can't fork. Oh. That way I... you can have a for a multi-threaded or even single-threaded server, you can basically make it so that if an attacker ever gets code execution, they're basically limited to the single process. You would create a persistent jail and use the post start hook to uh, jxec to it, either with some software which knows how to jail attach itself or uh, using the jxec command. Because then the jxec command, of course, can't be used to spawn a sub process, but if you basically j attach and then exec, that doesn't fork because it just exits within the existing process. Hmm. And that, for example, I've used for an async server, uh, that the async server isn't allowed to do anything but be an async server, and there's nothing but the single executable and its libraries installed in this minimal jail. All the configuration and code is on a read-only file system, and the data is on a second file system. And then good luck uh, doing anything if you you couldn't do via async if you get code execution. The thing to remember is, that I always miss is you have to do the minus A option on RCTL when adding a new item. Um, I am using the etsyrctl.conf. All I do is uh, service rctl start, and it loads the file. Yeah. Okay. The... So the I'm guessing... Yeah, I'm guess I'm guessing that it does that, but I can check the script. The thing is, make sure that sudo rctl displays the controls you expect to see. That that's what caught me out. And rctl. I, okay. It's sudo rctl, and it should spit out all the controls that are in place. And if that's not what you're expecting, then that's the issue. Yeah, it, it is exactly what I'm expecting. But okay. then if I do show you current utilization with dash U and I give it a subject such as JLLDAP0, now my actual memory use is higher than the limit that it was supposed to do. Um okay, it's okay, it's okay. I'll 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 dig into this. I just saw it today, so I still don't know what I'm going into for now. So I'll I'll play around and maybe report tomorrow. Um so you have to set a loader tunable to uh, enable this mechanism. Uh, you have you what what you read it with? If you set uh, this loader tunable, you can check its runtime value with the CTL. I I'm, I'm I I have a feeling that it's enabled, but let's check CCTL. Yep, it's one. It's definitely one. Okay, then resource limits should be applied and enforced. Got it. And however, it's not. So we need to figure out why. Okay. I'll I'll figure something out around it. Cool. Yeah. Wow, a gig a gigabit per second or a gigabyte with what? Oh, a giga oh a gigabyte per second. Wow, not bad. NFS v four. A gigabyte that's per second. Just, yeah, that's just ten gig. Yeah, 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 that's not, yeah. And so it's, it's using proper utilization of the switch. That's good. That's very yeah, good. For, as long as uh, you, your file system can keep up, sure, why yeah. not? <laughs> yeah, and I'm still not using Zill, by the way. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take your advice and add a Zill. Maybe either a separate a slug. There's or... always a Zill, but yes, we understand <laughs> you. Yeah, the Zill is just the... If you don't have a dedicated log intent logging device, the Zill is allocated from within the normal pool. Oh, Correct. slog it is then. Okay, got it. Yeah. Separate log device. Okay, anything Separate else, log. gang? Okay. No, thank you all very much. It looks like we have good progress. Did Jamie join? Not today. He's probably today. baking a turkey or something. Oh, it's it's your uh, turkey. Uh, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, but yeah. Close enough. <laughs> anything else or shall i call it 
Uh, Antonik, if you need contact details for uh, Rick, he's still active on the hackers mailing list. I highly recommend checking that out. Oh, then I'll go over his email and definitely uh, yep. get in touch. I because I'm very much interested in the future of NFS. Oh yeah, I people don't, live and die by it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Let's uh, perhaps meet a little later for ZFS and some of you for Beehive tomorrow, okay? Like and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care.